Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. All right, I'm just going to give it a moment to uh, get set up for folks to come in and join. Hello, if you are joining me live, go ahead and say hey. Let me know where you're logging in from. And if you're watching the replay of this later on, just drop a hashtag replay in the comments so that way I know uh, you are here and we can build community. All right, I'm just pinning a quick comment on IG. All right, here we go. We are getting ready to hop in. All right, there we go. Okay, y'all. Hey, it's Thursday. Um, hey, 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 we got St. Louis in the house. Oh, Vegas. Hey, hey, hey. I was actually thinking about a about Henderson, um, <clears throat> taking a trip to Henderson, Nevada, uh, just to like have some time in the mountains and just like chill and, and think about uh, the upcoming year. So I'm glad you're here. So glad you're here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump in. My name is Dr. Erica Jordan Thomas. You can call me Erica, you can call me JT, you can call me EJT. All three are totally cool. Um, but uh, I am CEO and founder of two businesses, Get Launch Consulting and EJT Consulting LLC. So EJT Consulting is my own personal consulting business, which I started four years ago. At the time, I was still a principal. And it was during a, a season of transition. And so um, during that time, I knew that I was gonna be transitioning out of the principal role, which was one of the hardest decisions that I made, um, but I didn't know what was next for me. And so I decided to start consulting as a way to experiment a little bit. And I had no idea the chapter that was uh, ahead of me in my consulting business, because through my consulting business, I had a whole new world of impact, being able to work with school leaders across the country and a whole nother experience of financial freedom because what I made in one day at the time, I, I, it took me about a week to make as a principal. Um, and now I make my principal salary in about five to six weeks, um, I have done that. And so um, I am really passionate about working with educators, high performing educators, edu educators from marginalized backgrounds to help them recognize their gifts, own their gifts, and be able to, to use those gifts to increase their impact and be able to experience financial freedom through those gifts. Because I do not believe that you have to sacrifice your, for, your purpose in order to get paid. That walking in purpose and being paid can coexist, and they should coexist. Um, so I'm excited for us to have this time together um, for JT Office Hours. And so again, if you're here and just joining, say hi in the chat. Let me know where you're logging in from. Um, and let me just give a quick rundown of how this works for my new folks who are joining us. So I do Office Hours with JT every other Thursday. So how this works is I have a private Facebook group for growing and aspiring education consultants. If you're with me on IG and you're not in the Facebook group, you can join us by simply clicking the link in my bio and that'll take you to the Facebook group to request to join. You just wanna make sure you answer the questions so that way we can approve you to join the group. And in the group, what we do is every other Thursday, we release a set of questions that folks submitted when they joined the group. That's why you want to make sure you answer the questions so that way we know what questions you have and we can have the opportunity to use those in the poll so you can get your questions answered. So every other Thursday we release a poll. The group votes on the questions that they want me to answer and the questions that the top three questions with the most votes. I go live the following Thursday and I answer them live. So that's what's going down that's what we're doing today i'm super excited I, I have some notes here for us to go through together because the three questions for this week are the following the first is how to determine projects to take on and which to pass on 
So how do you decipher which projects to say yes to and which projects to say no to? The second question is how do I know if my problem is narrow enough? That's question number two. And then question number three is where do I start in regards to, to growing a education consulting business? So those are the three questions that I'm gonna be talking through today. As we go throughout our time together, y'all know I'm an educator at heart, so I love to make this interactive. Um, feel free that if that prompts any questions, additional questions, thoughts, reactions, or reflections, please drop those in the chat. Um, and I want to acknowledge that there's there's wisdom in in the IG room, in the Facebook room, and so if it prompts thoughts from your own experience, please share those. All right, so we're going to jump in uh, to question number one, which is how to determine projects to take on and which to pass on. So this is a great question. This is a really great question. And I think it's, it's best to first start with thinking about the journey of your business, right? So when you're in the early stages of your business, you're just starting, you're just building clientele, what you choose to say yes and no to might look different than once you're, you kind of have a, a pipeline of clients, you have steady income, your revenue gets consistent, what you choose to say yes and no to might change and pivot. So I just want to acknowledge that because out of my personal experience of, of growing my own education consulting business, as well as working with my clients in Get Launch Consulting, so I've worked with 180 educators through our program, Get Launch Consulting, I'm, I've seen the patterns, right? And the patterns are, is typically when you are in the early stage of your business, you're you're you don't have to be as picky and choosy right <laughs> like being picky and choosy is a privilege right saying no to money is a privilege and and you don't some of us don't always have have that privilege really early on in our business it's always our right to say no but typically in the earlier stage of your business you're going to be in a position where you can afford you can you have um more of an ability to say yes, whether that ability is time, whether it's capacity, versus as you grow your business and, and you begin to grow your clientele. So I just named that because I think early on in folks in their business, you know, they've identified the problem that they're solving and then there's an opportunity that comes up and it's not quite the same problem. And so they're like, well, should I say yes? Should I say no? And it's like, why not? <laughs> like, if you want to, absolutely, go ahead and do it. If you have the time and capacity, and it's something that's of interesting to you, um, and there will come a time, you know, in your business where you're going to grow your clientele, you're going to grow your revenue, your revenue becomes steady and consistent to where you are going to have to have some clear criteria of what you say yes and no to. So what I say no to today, I probably said yes to maybe two or three years ago in my business because my criteria has changed and shifted. So that's the first thing that I just wanted to name is that early on in your business, um, I, I, many, I've, I've noticed that many folks starting out feel this pressure to only say yes to these opportunities that perfectly fit in the little square hole that they you know, define for their business. And that is absolutely your right. And know that that's also the time where you can experiment a little bit, right? Like you're still, getting clarity on exactly the problem you're solving, exactly who you serve, exactly what your services are. I mean, you can draft that all up and write it in a one page or put it on your website, but it takes actually doing to get real, real clarity around what those structures are in your business. And so I say that to say that I'm going to give you some criteria here in a moment. Um, but this criteria, though, you may not find yourself heavily leaning on or leaning into until you get to a point in your business where your revenue is more consistent, where your client base is more consistent, and now you don't have the same capacity you did early in your business to where you have to say no to some things. So you have to have some clear criteria of when you say no. Um, so that's just thing number one is early in your business, experiment, you know, your criteria, you might have loose criteria and that's okay. When you get to the point in your business where your, again, your revenue is becoming more consistent, you know, you don't have to say yes to everything because 
you know, you have have steady revenue coming in, you have a set of steady salary that you're funding for yourself to where you don't need every opportunity, right? Then that's when you wanna be really clear around some criteria of what would cause me to say no to an opportunity, right? So some criteria that I use that I have found to be really helpful, I actually um, got a set of questions from a podcast that I listened to. It was uh, Yvonne Orji and Lovey Ajahi Jones, the podcast that they have um, together. And it was um, one of their episodes, I think the name of the episode was The Fine Print of Success. Um, So if you're interested in the podcast, just search um, those two names, Javon Orji and Lovey Ajahi Jones. And in that episode, The Fine Print of Success, you know, they talk about like when your business and brand starts to grow and you can't say yes to everything anymore because you don't have the capacity, they present these five questions to ask yourself so that way you can be clear on, on when things should be a yes and when they should be a no. So I found these questions really helpful and I'm gonna share them with you. So the five questions are, the first one being, will it pay my fee, right? So that one's pretty direct and straightforward. Whatever your fee is, it's will this engagement pay my fee? The second question is, will I enjoy it? So that's actually been one of the questions, you know, that I think is the privilege of when you have steady revenue that you no longer feel obligated to do everything. Or <laughs> it's like if, if, if it does not make me happy, like I'm not gonna spend my time doing it because now I have the choice. Like I don't have to do these certain things. And so um, I'll give you an example of, um, there has been some opportunities that I received where the amount of work or whether it's just like the the vibe I'm getting from the client, I can tell I'm not gonna enjoy it um, because it is gonna require a lot of me. Um, it's gonna require me to step into you know something that I, I you know might have the ability to do, but like it, it doesn't give me as much energy as maybe some other things where it's like I don't enjoy that and like so that would be one of those things where it's like mm, no, I'm not gonna do that. The third question is, is it something new or different, right? And so um, new or different could mean like the actual structure of the service. It could be the audience, it could be the location, but is there something that's new or different about the opportunity that would would be pretty interesting, right? Um, That's something important to consider. And then the fourth question is, will this elevate my profile? And when we say elevate your profile, meaning um, will this be uh, provide me an opportunity to where um, it, whether it's it's seen as a credential or it provides me more additional credibility. Um, an example might be a TEDx talk, right? Where TEDx talks are not paid, or TED talks are not paid engagements, but they elevate your profile, right? Um, because of the brand of tax people of TED, who where people who are giving TED talks are seen as experts, um, they're they're you know providing um, the expertise, and so because of that, folks who do TED talks or TEDx talks, that is seen as elevating your profile. So that would be an example. And then lastly, will it put you in front of a larger audience? So thinking around how many people would you be, um, would now have more awareness to you and your brand? Um, And is that number significant enough to where it feels like, you know, a a worthy opportunity? And so those are the five questions. I'll just do a quick recap of those. Will it pay my fee? Will I enjoy it? Is it something new or different? Will it elevate my profile? And will it put me in front of a larger audience? So those are the five questions. And Levy and Yvonne, their thought process was, I would need at least three of those questions to be a yes in order for me to say yes to the opportunity. So notice, will it pay my fee is one of the questions, right? So that could be a no, 
but maybe it's something that'll elevate your profile it's new and different and it puts you in front of a larger audience so that feels worth it because it actually you know would would give you access to potential revenue that would not only compensate that opportunity but also provide further compensation so again a tedx talk is an example of that of that elevates your profile it puts you in front of a larger audience it could be something new and different but it won't pay your fee because those aren't paid speaking engagements um, so those are the five questions hopefully that's helpful um, let me know in the chat your thoughts or reactions to that. Which one of those questions feels new for you or most intriguing or maybe you hadn't thought about? Or if, if you're just kind of sitting there processing, um, either send me some hearts on, on Instagram where it's like, oh, those are interesting questions and I want to apply those to my practice. Or if you're on um, Facebook, just send me an emoji in the chat um, just to give me a little bit of feedback around, around how those questions are landing. So um, that's our first question. That's our first question. Um, for JT Office Hours is how to determine projects to take on and which to pass. Okay, so we're gonna move on to question number two. And again, if, if what we're chatting about and discussing sparks for you some follow-up questions, please drop those in the chat and I'll be happy to answer those. So the second question is how do I know if my problem is narrow enough? It's a great question. So, um, here's my thought here is how do I know if my problem is narrow enough is, well, can you actually provide a solution, right? Like that's kind of really the, the gut check or the measurement of is your problem narrow enough? And so if you're able to provide a solution, um, then your problem is, is narrow enough. So. Let me think of an example here is if you say I do, uh, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion work and the problem I solve is racism. Okay, that problem is really big. <laughs> so like, like that would be a problem that I would say is not narrow enough. And you could narrow that problem by getting more specific around how you define the problem. Yes, the problem is racism. And specifically, how does that manifest? What does it look like? So an example of narrowing that down could be um, providing, it could be the, defining a more narrow problem could sound like um, providing educators with the uh, skill set or knowledge base in order to interrogate um, their own biases and uh, develop their identity development or further their identity development. Um, so that, that would be a more narrow example of the problem. Uh, if you're defining the problem as educators don't have access to quality learning experiences that that provide them the space to interrogate the ways in which they have inhaled racism within our society and be able to, to interrogate their own identity development of to what extent they understand their identity and how that shapes their perspective or creates blind spots. Um, so that would be an example of like narrowing the problem. Um, and so that guiding question there is when you think about the problem you've identified in your business, take a step back and think about, all right, is this something that when I articulate the solution for, it feels aligned to the problem? Um, so uh, let me know in the chat there if, if that it resonates, if that makes sense, if there's a problem that you're processing through in your business um, and you're like, I'm not quite sure if this is narrow enough, drop it into the chat and I can provide some feedback. The other thing that I wanted to share here too is a part of narrowing the problem is also the strategy to narrowing the problem is also narrowing your audience. So even if you were to say, for example, um, that you provide professional development to school leaders, right? One way to narrow the problem would also be actually narrowing your audience. So do you work with all school leaders or do you work with predominantly uh, school leaders of color who are in years one through four who work in large um, urban school districts or maybe charter networks? 
um, that would be another example of how you narrow the problem um, is actually through narrowing your audience. Of who do you actually serve? Who are you actually targeting for the solution? Um, so um, that is just some, some thoughts and advisement in terms of narrowing the problem. Um, and again, if, if you have a specific problem that you're thinking about and you're wondering like, hmm, I wonder if this is narrow enough, um, drop it into the chat and I can get some feedback. All right. Um, I see Andre put a comment of, will it pay my fee? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so this is, that's one of those questions that, you know, I think it's an important um, one to acknowledge because, you know, y'all will hear me all the time where I will name pe people need to pay your worth, right? Like they need to pay you for, for your gifts, your talents, and your services. And acknowledging that, you know, when it comes to negotiating, right, like the practice and art of negotiating, money is one thing that you can negotiate, right? There are also other things, other sources of power that you could be negotiating in addition to money. So for example, if someone couldn't pay your fee, um, a, a piece that you could negotiate is, okay, well, can I you know, do a social media takeover for your organization and spend the day sharing content around whatever problem you're solving in your business? It could be, you know, I'm doing a live workshop and if you can't pay my fee, can you at least um, uh, share the information about my workshop on your listserv of 10,000 people, right? Like, like there are other things that are on the table that you can negotiate, um, which is why it helps put in that perspective of why the will it pay my fee is just one of the five questions. And it's an important question and it's not the question because there's other things in your business that, you know, given your priorities that you could be negotiating around. Um, or it could be, you know, if, if the person who is a potential client, they are one degree removed from someone who is the head of an organization that is your entire client base, you can negotiate, well, can you make an introduction? Um, so again, multiple things to kind of be thinking about there um, and, and as, uh, with those five questions that I shared before. Okay, all right, so now we're on to our third and final question. Um, for my folks who just joined, we're in the middle of JT office hours. Uh, we went through question number one, which is how to determine projects to take on and which to pass on. We just answered question number two of how to know if my problem is narrow enough. And now we're moving on to question number three is how do I start? So if you just joined us and you missed the last two, you can catch the replay on either my Instagram page or in our Facebook group. If you're on Instagram and you're not in the Facebook group, just click the link in my bio to join us. Okay, so this last question of where do I start? So I, I, I think this is a good question and I'll be honest, I feel some kind of way about this question. I do, I feel some kind of way about this question because I believe that us as educators, we need to give ourselves more credit of that we know more than what we do that we actually could come up with some ways to start, right? So like, for example, if you want to provide um, coaching to teachers, beginning teachers, I'm assuming there's probably either a beginning teacher that you know, or a school leader that you know, or a district, like you have a contact that will, you know, could be an opportunity to allow you to step into that. And so I just share that because oftentimes when I hear this question, it's not because we really don't know where to start, it's because we're scared. <laughs> like, and so I'll just, I'll just name the underneath like mindset that oftentimes I'm seeing behind this question when people say, well, where do I start? You know, um, I have, I've, what my observation has been for myself as well as folks that I work with is when we are in survival mode, we come up with a lot of starting places. 
right? So like, if we, survivor mode could look like I'm getting furloughed from my job, survivor mode could look like I'm literally at my wit's end and I need something different, survivor mode could look like I have some large unexpected expense that has to be covered in order for me and my family to stay afloat. Like when we're in some type of crisis, we can very quickly think of starting places. So um, I just share that because again, like oftentimes when people ask this question of where do I start, there's usually a little bit of mindset underneath this of like, of, of what is keeping you from actually just taking a step and testing what you think might be the starting place. Um, because we, I, I guarantee there's, there's probably some hypothesis that you have around who you could talk to, who you could connect with to just do it. Um, but usually there's some type of fear, whether it's fear of failure, fear of rejection um, that's keeping us back. And sometimes it's fear of success, even though most of us may not be able to articulate uh, that. But um, sometimes I have seen that that's at play when we're asking this, where do I start question. So I am gonna answer the question of where do I start, but I just say that because every time I like, I, 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 I read the question, I'm like, you could have been starting while you typing this question. <laughs> Like you could have been doing something, like you could have emailed somebody, you could have like Googled, like you could have, you know, reached out, sent an email, text somebody. Like while, while, we're, while we're discussing the question, like if you were in fight or flight tomorrow, if you lost your job tomorrow, what would you do? That's what you need to do today. That's where you start. Um, so let me answer the question and give you a couple of places to start. So. I've kinda, I kinda indirectly <clears throat> mentioned this, but I mean, and this is not a starting place, it is the continued work, but like there's mindset work, right? So like if you have likely asked the question of where do I start, um, I think there's an opportunity to kinda think about like what has been some of the mindsets that you may have held that have prevented you from getting started, right? Like do you believe that you are worth a 10, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 dollar contract? Do you believe that, right? Would you feel uncomfortable if someone would give you a 50K contract? Do you feel like what you do isn't special? Do you feel uh, afraid or nervous to actually talk about what you want to be true for your consulting business? Right, are you, are you um, feeling as if there isn't enough money um, that is within reach? Do you feel like you would be nervous <clears throat> to make a, com a financial commitment to invest in your growth in your business? Um, that means that there's usually some type of money mindset there. So I just give those as examples. Those are all the possible mindsets, but those are just examples. If any of those resonate with you, then I would encourage you to explore and interrogate it a little bit um, around some of that mindset work. And then the second thing that are more technical is clarifying your problem and clarifying your audience. So what's the problem that you're gonna solve and who are you gonna be serving? And part of this requires deep, deep research and understanding around, when I say clarifying the problem, like you need to be able to state some, some data. So even if you're working with beginning teachers, what percentage of teachers within the school system are beginning teachers? You need to know that. What are, are how much professional development do beginning teachers typically have access to? You need to know that. Are there any surveys that have been done by either the US Department of Education, the National Center of Education Statistics around beginning teachers related to their satisfaction, their job satisfaction, their pay, their demographics? Like you need to like, fall in love with the problem to be able to immerse yourself in, in the data and, and research that, that is outside of you. Because oftentimes I've seen um, us as educators will make the misstep of assuming because we, we are the person that we want to serve, that we know the problem, when you're going to have to hold it objectively. Um, you're going to have to approach it as if this is something new so that way you can begin to build 
your collective understanding of what is the scope of this problem um, because you're going to need to know that when it comes to your messaging so clarifying the problem and then clarifying your audience which we kind of talked a little bit about before but who are you serving and this is more just naming demographics of like their education status their location their race but thinking through what is their experience what are their pain points right <clears throat> who is a fit and who's not a fit for your services so i would imagine one of the pain points for a beginning teacher right now might be not just time management but like paint the picture of what does the experience look like for them does the experience look like consistently being the first in the building and being the last one in the building and still not having their lesson plan done because they're not sure if they've unpacked their standard correctly right and so like like getting really really deep in that experience and that can look like doing some interviews with your target client and so whether that's a focus group, whether that's a survey, if you're on my Instagram, I recently posted, made a post around three ways to conduct market research. You wanna check out that post, talking to who you plan to serve to learn more about that experience. That's gonna help give you data back around how to um, inform and shape your services to be able to best serve who you wanna serve. So those are some starting points. The mindset work is always there clarifying your problem, clarifying your audience. And then there's, those are the starting points, right? Like there's a whole nother set of business infrastructure of your pricing, your services, you know, branding, all that stuff. But like, that's where you would start. Um, but I will name that if you ask that question or if you're wondering that question, then you need to be at my live private training next Saturday, December 11th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I am not only gonna be answering the question of where do you start, but I'm also going to answer the question of where do you go next? What's step two, three, and four? So during that live private training, I'm walking you through the four parts of growing and scaling your business to six figures. Um, and that is without the, you know, having to leave your job. And so you don't have to leave your job in order to grow your consulting business. I was a principal when I started my consulting business. I was a full-time doctoral student. Um, through the majority of, you know, growing my consulting business. So you don't have to leave your nine to five, um, but I'm going to be walking you through the steps to actually grow and scale to a six figure education consulting business. And so in order to attend that training, all you have to do is just complete a super brief application. And that application link, if you're in my Facebook group, it's linked in this post. If you're on Instagram, it's linked in my bio. And what that will do is it'll shoot to me and my team, we'll review it, and if we feel like you know you would be a good fit for the training, we'll um, accept you and you'll get information about the live private training. Also during that training, I'll be sharing more about Get Launch Consulting. And so if you're, you're interested in that program, which is a nine month program specifically for educators that provides them the business tools to be able to grow their education consulting business to six figures, I'll go into more detail during that live private training. And so that application will also give you the opportunity to learn more about the program. Um, so that's all I got applied to the live private training. Um, again, it's linked in my bio on IG and it's in this post on Facebook. Um, and if you got any questions about the live private training, just shoot me a DM. And so I'm glad we had this time together. As always, I'll be back um, in two Thursdays. Um, I believe, yes, I'll be back in two Thursdays and then we're going to go on break and I'll be back in the new year. Um, but excited to have this time with y'all for JT Office Hours and I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great and safe day and we'll talk soon.